Welcome to Danielle Smith's Fraser Forum. This program is part of a series of podcasts doing in-depth interviews on free enterprise and personal liberty. I'm your host, Danielle Smith, president of the Alberta Enterprise Group. Go to fraserforum.org where you can subscribe, comment on the program, and see links to the studies we discuss. You will also find archives of previous episodes. Our email address is danielle at fraserforum.org. We'd love to hear from you. We are so much more wealthy compared to previous generations. If you're not worried about your immediate survival, you're not worried about where your next meal is coming from, you can start to think about other aspects of life. And one of the things that seems to happen as economic progress takes place and as standards of living go up, people tend to worry about the future. And and one of those uh, aspects is uh, environmental quality. Welcome once again to Danielle Smith's Fraser Forum. My guest today is Glenn Fox. He's a retired professor of agricultural economics from the University of Guelph and also a senior fellow of the Fraser Institute. And we are going to be talking about the economics of environmental policy. Professor, thank you so much for being with me today. Oh, you're very welcome. There's so many entry points into talking about environmental uh, economics, uh, but maybe I should I should start by telling you my entry point was a, a book I read when I got involved in property rights advocacy in the 1990s, and it was Property Rights in Defense of Nature by Elizabeth Brubaker. And to me, that has always then framed the way I look at environmental issues. And so much of your writing is framed around the issue of, of property rights and market mechanisms. So I want to I want to start there. Um, j- just t- tell me a little bit about uh, you. You you know a little bit about the background of that book from uh, Elizabeth Rubaker. It sounds like a funny story. Why don't you tell it for us? Yes, sometime after the book was published, one of my students was working as an intern for Elizabeth, and he came back to me with a story. And he said, do you know that Elizabeth wrote that book to prove you wrong, which I had not heard. And Elizabeth had never said that to me. So uh, so I, I got the backstory. When Elizabeth first arrived to work at Environment Probe in Toronto, she was in her apartment making lunch on a day when I happened to be doing a noon hour CBC interview, uh, which boiled down to me giving a book review of Terry Anderson and Donald Leal's then recently published book called Free Market Environmentalism. And this was an interview that was supposed to go for 10 minutes in the, in the CBC studio in Toronto. And the interviewer got quite interested in this book, which I continued to talk about. So I think we talked for like a half an hour, maybe 45 minutes. And Elizabeth was sitting in her apartment while she was making lunch in her kitchen with the radio on and listening to this crazy professor from Guelph talk about property rights in the environment. And she eventually abandoned the lunch making project and started to scribble down some notes of a book that she was going to write uh, to prove me wrong. And then she did her research and she uh, produced ultimately property rights in defense of nature. I now sit on her board, uh, and I use that book in my first year course on environmental economics and policy. And I tell students, I've got to be the most open-minded professor that you will ever have in your career because one of your textbooks was written by someone trying to prove me wrong. That is such an amazing story. And I I love the fact that you've maintained uh, a long-term friendship and and relationship with her. Let's talk about what the alternative is, because I think there'll probably be people listening who may have had the same starting point as as many do in the environmental movement, that you, you can't possibly rely on markets. You can't possibly rely on the profit motive. You need to have government regulation. So, so explain a little bit as a starting point why it is that that's the reflexive response, that, that, there, that the government is the answer. Well, in the North American context, I think it might be simply a product of our history and culture. There's a story that I sometimes tell students in my first year class about an experience that I had in Germany in the early 1990s. So this was before Anderson and Leal's book came out. I was part of a delegation of faculty 
from the University of Guelph that were visiting some European universities. And we, on a Sunday, didn't have any official duties to perform, and we prevailed on our German hosts to take us on a sightseeing tour of the area. And so we rented a van and we were traveling around through the Black Forest and it was gorgeous. We're having a wonderful time. And then my colleagues decided that they were getting thirsty and they wanted to get a drink. And the, our German hosts and uh, amateur tour guides said, well, there's, we think there's an establishment in a nearby town and we can take you there. So everything's fine. So, so we uh, pulled off the road and the place that we were going to go to was really a very old walled city. I expected it had been inhabited by humans for at least a thousand years, maybe longer. And the river had been diverted around the city walls as sort of a moat. And we had to park our van and then walk across a footbridge to go into this town. As we were walking across the bridge, I looked down into the river and was absolutely astonished at what I saw. There were brown trout, magnificent mm. brown trout. There were many of them. They were big, they were healthy looking animals. And in fact, everyone else in the group walked on ahead. And they didn't realize that I was still standing there in the middle of this bridge, looking down into the river. And after a while, they noticed I was missing. Some of the hosts scurried back and said, you know, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I pointed at the river and I said, that's amazing. And they looked at me and they looked at the river and they looked at me and they thought, you know, was I having some sort of medical crisis? Was there some problem? Should I, should they get a doctor for me? And I said, no, 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 look, look at those fish in the river. And they said, yes, we see the fish in the river. And I said, well, it, I've never seen anything like that in Ontario. Mm -hmm. I've never seen anything like that in Canada. If that were to occur in Ontario, the banks of the river would very quickly be populated with anglers who would proceed to catch the fish and take them away and then the fish would be gone and then they looked at me like i was a martian like i was an alien that they never heard anything quite so strange as that and they explained to me that somebody owned those fish huh. and they didn't know none of them were anglers they didn't know who owned them it could be an individual it could be a family it could be a club it could be a municipality but they knew that somebody owned those fish and if anybody wanted to uh, fish, they knew that they'd have to get that owner's permission. They said it would be just as strange for someone to walk down to the banks of the river and start to fish without the owner's permission, as it would be for someone in Canada to drive a truck into a, a farmer or a rancher's field and start loading up cattle without the rancher's permission. That is so interesting. So explain to me where you think the difference comes in. Is it just because with the passage of time and more people crowding into an area, creating scarcity, that property rights mechanisms develop? Is it because Canada is such a new young country and we're so spread out and there's so many people we never really felt we had to apply property rights to certain types of an environmental amenity? How, how do you interpret what you saw? Well, I think there's been a different institutional and legal history in Canada. And uh, my ancestors came from Scotland, probably displaced from as part of the enclosure movement. And in Scotland uh, at the time, golf was the working man's game and fishing was the aristocrat's game. And, and my hypothesis, and I've never actually traced through the legal history, but that the influence of those Scottish settlers was uh, such, I suspect, that they didn't want to see ownership of fish. They didn't want huh. fish to be the rich man's game. And so in North America, fishing is the poor man's game or poor woman's game. And golf uh, is uh, for, the, uh, for the upper classes. Isn't that interesting? I'd love for you to explore that more in, in maybe a future book. That mm -hmm. is a fascinating uh, analysis in history. Maybe we need to understand a bit more about where property rights comes from, because it, I think there is, uh, especially as we're seeking reconciliation with First Nations, I think there is still this um, notion that a uh, common property, government-owned property, public lands is the ideal. And I, I want to go back to sort of another foundational document for me about where 
property rights comes from. And I think of it as John, John Locke. Maybe, it's, maybe you'll trace it uh, to a different scholar, but the notion that when you put your blood, sweat, and tears into the land, you work the land, you improve it, in doing so, you've intermingled your labor with the land, and that is what creates a property right. That's sort of how I've conceptualized it. But but tell me what you, what the foundational work is, so that so that we can know what your starting point is. Well, my background is in economics, and so I tend to look to the economic literature uh, for the origin stories about property rights. And that's not to disregard John Locke. I think Locke's uh, insights about homesteading and the general classical liberal or libertarian theory of, of self-ownership and establishing rights to the external world or elements in the external world uh, through homesteading, I think is an important uh, story. I think some of the economics literature has added some, um, some additional insight to that. One of the authors that I came across fairly early, so I came back from this trip from Germany and, and frankly, I was baffled and confused. Because when I looked down in that river, I saw something I'd never seen before. And I was raised to be an angler. My grandmother and my aunt and my extended family taught me to fish. But my earliest memories are with them fishing. So this is something that, that was pretty uh, foundational to my whole existence at that point. And so, and so I, I came back and I was deeply puzzled by this. And so I started to look around and I came across a book by John Dales. And John Dales was an economics professor at the University of Toronto. And he wrote a book in 1968 called, I think, Pollution, Property, and Prices. And there were, there were a number of important contributions that he made. First, uh, John Dales, as far as I can tell, was the first person to propose tradable emissions permits. Hmm. He, I don't think he gets credit for that. When he proposed it in 1968, it was considered to be an heretical idea. What was he applying it to at that time? Because sulfur dioxides, I think, were the first things that tradable emissions of permits were applied to, or am I, was it even earlier than that? Well, his, his work predates the application. Uh, and, and when he suggested tradable emissions permits, people uh, were appalled at this idea that this was immoral, uh, this, if not economically hazardous. So he was treated, uh, I think, as, a, as a, a very eccentric individual for proposing a tradable emissions permits. Now, they've become part of the mainstream. Completely. And what do you think? I, I think that's the, maybe the reason why people felt that there needed to be a government solution, because it took a while for the market mechanisms to develop. And there was a growing interest in being concerned about the environment. I don't know if you've ever tracked the history of that. I think I tend to think of the environmental movement as being a modern movement. When you look at some of the uh, environmental destruction that has happened historically, and I think we can all look at pictures and we can see what happened to, to rivers um, mm -hmm. historically going back hundreds of years. So I, I think of caring about the environment as being something of a modern creation. Uh, it, am I wrong? Have we always had this this value of the environment? Well, I think the environmental movement, and I was involved in the environmental movement when I was in high school in the late '60s and early '70s. We had a a small environmental club, and we did fun. We, we did a funeral for the Don River uh, in Toronto. Uh, we did How a. How was it? What was going on in there? Well, the the, the Don River was. Uh, badly polluted. It didn't catch fire like the river did in Ohio, but it was uh, it was a filthy stretch of water. And so as a protest, a bunch of, it wasn't just our high school, but there were many uh, high school students from Southern Ontario that that participate in in this uh, death ritual, this funeral for the Don River uh, as, as a protest movement. But we also did some fundraising and we bought some land in the in the Dundas Valley area, which is where I went to high school, uh, which subsequently became part of a conservation area. Hmm. Um, and so those are very early days in terms of a social movement of environmentalism. And of course, grassroots things like that were springing up uh, all around uh, North America. The first Earth Day, I think, was 1970. If I uh, 
uh, if I recall. I think it is because uh, I was born in seventy one, so I've my I've lived my whole life post uh, okay. post Earth post the first Earth Day. You're a post Earth Day baby, so. I, well, yeah. and you know, it's funny too, because when I look back on some of the events that I've seen in recent history, there was a whale, remember, that found its way into the River Thames and everyone was rooting for it mm -hmm. to get back out to sea. And I was thinking, wow, a hundred years ago, someone would have just harpooned that thing and <laughs> turned it into whale oil. And it's mm -hmm. sort of amazing to me that there's been such a dramatic shift in our relationship to nature. I'm not even sure if I, maybe it's a philosophical dis discussion to find out why that is, but do you know why that is? Um, you know, I've done some reading on this. Uh, Robert, the late Robert Nelson, who was uh, an environmental policy scholar at the University of Maryland, uh, wrote a book, I think it was published in 2010, uh, called The New Holy Wars, mm -hmm. Economic Religion Versus Environmental Religion in the 21st Century. Uh, and he does a really insightful job of characterizing the history of the environmental movement. He does it for the, for economics as well, but he uh, characterizes the history of uh, the environmental movement and he draws uh, parallels with certain systems of religious belief hmm. that, uh, uh, that uh, preceded um, the, uh, the emergence of the environmental movement. One of the things he pointed out, that I was not familiar with is that the founder of the Sierra Club, who was an early leader in the environmental movement, obviously, was raised in a Presbyterian sect. I think they were called the Campbellites. And the Campbellites held to a theological view that nature was a way that we could perceive God. Hmm. That, that nature was a form of God's revelation to people. Now, that's not exclusive to this particular uh, uh, Christian sect, but they took a very high view of this. And Nelson's reading uh, of, of uh, Muir, uh, John Muir, I believe, uh, who, who was raised in this sect, is that when he talked about Yosemite as a cathedral, he meant it literally. Mm -hmm. he, he saw it as a form of spiritual and religious inspiration. Now, we've secularized the cathedral metaphor now for natural spaces, but there was a, a much more a direct connection in Muir's upbringing and background, according to um, Robert Nelson's research. It's, it's such a great explanation because it explains why the love of the environment and animals and biodiversity is so visceral for people. And so you mm. are dealing with an emotional response. And so that's why it can be hard to talk about the environment in very rational terms and property rights and trainable emissions because people do feel so deeply about it. But if we can get to the same end, which is everybody wants to ensure that they've got good environmental quality, then, then mm -hmm. I guess it's really a question of what is the best way to do that. So let's begin by talking a, a little bit more about the issue of property rights, because it, it, in some ways to me, it seems that the case is easier to make the closer you are to home. So when we talk about the homesteader who has a river going past him, I think we sort of intuitively understand that the farmer upstream can't put a bunch of junk into the river that would prevent the downstream guy from being able to enjoy good water quality, or he can't divert uh, too much water mm -hmm. to prevent the guy downstream from being able to get his fair share of water. So where does that notion come from, this riparian rights notion? Because I, I think that in some ways is the most accessible way to understand how why property rights are so important when you're trying to protect nature. That, that's an interesting point that you raise. My actual academic training and my thesis research at the master's and PhD level was not in on environmental topics. I oh. was a specialist in the economics of technological change in agriculture. And so that's what I imagined my career would be about when I became a professor. But shortly after I joined the faculty at the University of Guelph, I had a conversation with my chairman about an emerging issue in agriculture uh, in, in Canada about the erosion problem. There was a book published by Senator Sparrow, who was the chairman of the Senate uh, Agriculture Committee 
sometime in the early 1980s. I joined the faculty in 1985, and the book had been out for a few years at that point. And the title of the book was called Soil at Risk. And in the book, Senator Sparrow and his associates presented an estimate of huge damages to cropland in Canada from mm -hmm. erosion that was threatening the future of agriculture as we knew it. And so I arrived as a newly minted PhD, an assistant professor in an agricultural college in the midst of all of that. And so my first research project was to examine this from an economic point of view. And I learned two things that really surprised me. The first thing that I learned was that the evidence that erosion was a serious productivity problem that threatened the future of agriculture was a statement that seemed to have no foundation in research or fact. Uh, on the other hand, but that's not to say that erosion wasn't a problem because erosion is a problem, was a problem then, and in some cases continues to be a problem, not because of the productivity effects on the farm, but because when the displaced sediment, because erosion is the transport of soil particles, typically by water in Eastern Canada, sometimes by wind in Western Canada, when it gets off the farm and into the stream and into the river, there it does quite a bit of harm to the people, as you say, downstream. So the farmer, through this process, which is often not acknowledged or recognized, this eroded sediment is degrading fish habitat, it's increasing water treatment costs, it's causing water quality problems downstream, and the farmer's not held accountable for that. So how is it? In fact, this was the question that sort of motivated my interest in the, in, in the early days. How is it that these costs can be imposed on people downstream and the farmer upstream uh, is not held accountable for that? And there are a variety of institutional and historical reasons for that. But the main reason is that farmers operate behind a, a, a shield of liability for trespass and nuisance. Hmm. Typically, these are called right to farm laws. And as long as you're following what's called normal farming practices, then you won't be held liable for damages either through airborne or waterborne uh, substances that cause nuisance or trespass or damage or harm to people downwind or downstream. I thought, well, that's weird. Why is it that there isn't this accountability? Why aren't people being held liable? That turns out to be a fairly general problem. And to her credit, Elizabeth examined this in a lot of contexts outside the agricultural context that I was most familiar with. Let, let me ask you two things that stem from that. It's almost like the question of if a tree falls in a forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? If a farmer allows for erosion and there's no one downstream to be harmed, does it need to be abated? Does the, does the violation only come into play when you have actual measurable harm to somebody else? Or should you just have good practices for the sake of having good practices? Is it, it, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where the right comes comes into play. Because the other aspect is I moved into an agriculture community. I lived in a big city, moved into an agriculture community, and there is a feedlot here and a large packing plant. And lots of days you can go out and you can smell the money. And that's what I refer to it as. There's a the smell of money out there today. But I sort of accepted that by moving to an area, they were there first. And I knew what I was getting into when I moved into the community. Mm -hmm. So who am I to complain? Um, I, I maybe have a lower value in my home as a result of accommodating the conditions that I found here. I'm just wondering when the nuisance or trespass becomes such that it, it needs a policy solution for it. Mm -hmm. Well, the situation that you've described and the practice in which you've engaged apparently is in the economics and legal literature called coming to the nuisance. Uh, so the nuisance was there before you got there. The, the feedlot was emitting odors into the atmosphere, which were blowing downwind to wherever you're currently residing. And you moved into that. 
the economic perspective on that is that, and therefore, as a result, you probably paid less for your house than you would have uh, had that nuisance not been in place. And so if you come to the nuisance economically, that's already been factored into what you, uh, what you uh, paid for. This is one point on which uh, Elizabeth and I have had uh, active uh, debates over the years, the, the problem of coming to the nuisance that, uh, uh, that she and I don't necessarily see uh, uh, eye to eye on that. And a related concept is the character of the neighborhood. So you moved into a neighborhood that had a particular character and the character was livestock production that takes place uh, in the area where you are, uh, are situated. So let's back up time a little bit uh, to prior to you arriving in the community. Well, you bought your house from somebody else and they maybe bought their house from somebody else. And maybe the house was there, the original homeowner was there before the feedlot was constructed. And in that case, mm. that person was subject to the, to the nuisance, was subject to the harm. Here's, here's where history becomes important, however, because something which is perceived to be undesirable today might not have been perceived to be undesirable two or three or four generations ago. Maybe the person living in your house before the feedlot was constructed didn't have a job and then got a job when the feedlot was constructed and said, you know, it's a little smelly, but I've got a regular paycheck coming in now. And that, that, that's another thing that I think is important to appreciate when you were talking about the rise of the environmental movement earlier, uh, that people have a different view on environmental uh, stewardship today than our ancestors did. And one of the reasons is we have a much higher standard of living mm -hmm. than our ancestors did. And so we're not really worried about sustenance now, for the most part, compared to what my great grandfather and great grandmother faced trying to eke out a living on a very rocky farm in Simcoe County uh, in Ontario. Oh, that makes sense. You would have an exemption for those who were producing food because food is so foundational to living mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to put a bunch of restrictions on. But now that most of us go shopping um, at a grocery store and have mm -hmm. a ready supply of mass produced goods mm -hmm. that diminishes the regard that we have for those or the deference that we have for those, uh, those nuisance laws. Is that what it is? Well, there, uh, I think there are two things in, in, in what you're saying is first, if we think that our food comes from the grocery store, then, you know, we're not fully aware of, of where the food really comes from. It doesn't originate in the grocery store. That's just where we get it or in the restaurant. Uh, and if we, uh, and particularly as populations like Canada's increasingly are urbanized, we're getting further and further and further away from a time when people had direct family contact with primary food production. So not everybody lived on farms 100 years ago, but pretty much everybody knew somebody who lived on a farm. Today, very few people live on farms and very few people even know somebody who lives on a farm. So, so culturally, we're separated from food production and we're separated from the smell of making money. That, uh, that you described in livestock production. But the other thing, and this is what I was getting at in my remarks earlier, is we are so much more wealthy. Now, regardless of whether we live in an urban area or a rural area compared to previous generations. And if you're more wealthy, if you think about uh, the, the traditional Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you're not worried about your immediate survival, you're not worried about where your next meal is coming from, you're not worried about where you're, uh, if you're going to have a roof over your head or if your house is going to, you know, collapse around you, then you can start to think about other aspects of life. And one of the things that seems to happen as economic progress takes place and as standards of living go up, people tend to worry about the future. 
people tend to worry about other qualitative aspects of life. Um, and, and one of those uh, aspects is uh, environmental quality. I'm, I'm glad you do so much work on cropland because I think we've got a, um, we've got almost a double mindedness in how we approach the issue of, of cropland. Cause to the, to your point, we're wealthier, we're less food insecure. And so we have more concern about the environment. But on the other hand, you do have this movement of, oh my goodness, we've got to make sure that we protect the, the best cropland, the best farmland. We can't allow mm. for urban sprawl to take away our potential food production. And so, uh, but you also have farmers on the other hand as well, as we were talking about, um, if, you, if you value farming and you know that your food comes from a farm and not from a grocery store, you wanna see them able to produce and have a healthy, profitable operation. But then you also have an environmental movement that talks about, should they be using pesticides and should they be using chemical fertilizers? And so we have, a, I, th I think, a double-mindedness about it. But I, I want to talk to you about that issue because you said you studied erosion, but mm -hmm. I also know that you've studied the issue of, are we actually losing our best cropland, our best farmland? Because I think there's a perception that we are. Most of us live near a big city. And we can remember what it looked like mm -hmm. from 20 or 30 years ago and what it looks like now. And we remember the fields that were there before. And we think, gosh, mm -hmm. we must have lost some important productive lands in that mm -hmm. growth. And that's, I think, led to a lot of municipal zoning policies and restrictions on development. So I want to understand, <laughs> is it true? <laughs> are, are we actually, do we have less cropland today than we did back in the 1950s? Well, you, you, you've kind of touched on a, a, an aspect of my personal story. I grew up outside Hamilton, Ontario, in a place called Clappison's Corners, which is simply an intersection of two highways. And I, when I was in high school, worked for a local farmer. And we used to grow barley on some fields in the Clappison's Corners area. And those fields don't grow barley anymore. Hmm. One of them grows a Canadian tire. Uh, one of them grows a Walmart, uh, and and uh, one of them grows a Value Village, and you know the strip mall uh, uh, enterprises that you can imagine pop up around those types of uh, facilities. And so those fields that I used to drive a tractor and I used to fertilize and I used to plant and harvest grain on are no longer harvesting grain. And for most Canadians who live in urban areas, if that's what they see, they see, well, that farmland has gone away. That mm -hmm. agricultural land has gone away. Surely we must be losing some. The, the problem with that perspective is that Ontario is a very big place and Canada is an even bigger place than that. And the fact that many people don't get out much into the countryside can influence their perception. So if I only saw that local area where I used to grow barley when I was a teenager, and I see that that's gone, if I extrapolate that to the province of Ontario, I think, oh my goodness, what, what are we going to eat in the future? So uh, about five uh, years ago, one of my graduate students and I decided to look at this issue uh, from a statistical point of view, and we asked the question, uh, what's happening to agricultural land in Ontario? Is Ontario running out of agricultural land? And the Fraser Institute was uh, gracious enough to publish the report that we did uh, on, that, uh, on that research. It was part of her master's thesis research, and we converted it uh, to a shorter uh, research report. And the punchline of that report is that there is more cropland in Ontario today than there was when I was born. And I was born some years before the first Earth Day. <laughs> but some pe people will hear that and they say, that can't possibly be. I, it, does, it seems to defy what I see with my own eyes. So what is the dynamic that's happening there? Well, that's not to say that there aren't areas like the, that farmland where I used to work when I was a teenager that isn't farming anymore. But what people don't appreciate is that cropland has expanded in other areas. And there have been two or three contributing factors. One, in Eastern Ontario, there was quite a bit of rural land that was abandoned from agricultural production in the 1920s and 30s and was al allowed to grow up to brush hmm. that has come back into agricultural production. 
uh, as prices have changed and the prices of land relative to the prices of crops have changed. Farmers have also made extensive investments in something that's called tile drainage. I don't want to get into a lot of technical details on this, but tile drainage involves installing, now it, it, it's actually plastic pipe. Originally it was not plastic pipe, but now it's plastic pipe, which is perforated underneath their fields. Because one of the problems that we have in crop production in Ontario is often that there's too much water, particularly mm -hmm. early in the year. And so tile drainage enables farmers to be more consistent in getting on fields to plant crops. And even in the fall, sometimes there's too much moisture and without tile drainage, they can't be sure they're gonna get on the field with machinery to harvest the crops. So a tile drainage has made land which formerly wasn't suitable for crop production is now suitable hmm. for crop production. The other thing that's happened and to, to a, a degree, my colleagues in plant science here at the University of Guelph have made con contributions to this, is developing varieties of crops that are better suited to the climate conditions in Ontario, which on a global scale, we have a relatively short growing season and, and colder temperatures. But plant breeders have produced crops that uh, that can grow in areas where that was not possible before. My, yesterday, my daughter and I uh, were driving north of the village where we live. And it was an area that many years ago, when I first moved to Guelph, moved to Guelph my, my wife and I used to drive up there. And I, I said to my daughter yesterday, see these farms that we're driving by today? When your mother and I first saw these farms, in the mid 1980s, they didn't look nearly as productive. They didn't look mm. nearly as prosperous as they do today. Now they're growing excellent corn crops. They're growing soybean crops. The farms are much, much better off. And in part, it's because they can grow these higher valued crops, they feed livestock uh, because their yields are better. We used to hardly ever see soybeans in this area. And this is like an hour north of where I live. So it's, hmm. I'm not talking about driving a long distance. But soybeans have moved further north into that area. Corn is much more productive in that area. So, so there are areas where crops are being grown now that they weren't being grown um, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Is it because of the better practices you were talking about or is it because we're getting warmer and it's a climate change issue? Uh, I attribute most of it to better varieties hmm. uh, because uh, what plant breeders are doing is that they're, they're coming up with varieties that can, uh, that can thrive in the shorter growing season and with the... Uh, uh, the, the lower temperatures relative to the corn belt in the United States, right, uh, that, uh, that prevail in the Ontario uh, context. I suspect that there also are some climate uh, aspects to it as well, that, that to the extent that, that uh, and, and one of my other students and I did a little bit of work on this a couple of years ago, trying to measure the, um, the length of the growing season. And based on the climate data that we were able to access for Ontario, uh, concluded that, that the growing season has gotten about one day longer hmm. every decade uh, for the past uh, 50 or 60 years. Now, one day may not seem like very much, but that's one more day, and, and that's every 10 years. It gets longer by about one more day. Uh, and so that's one more day in the growing season that uh, that crops can do their thing with photosynthesis and produce grain. You're delving into an area of great controversy. The University of Alberta marketing manager got fired because she broadcast the results of a finding that climate change and warmer weather would actually be good for agricultural production in Canada. And have you done much uh, on those lines? It is, it is tricky because every time we talk about climate change, we only really talk about it in mm -hmm. terms of the negatives and harms, but mm -hmm. it sounds like you've you're doing some research that, that suggests there might be some benefits. Well, 
some of my uh, colleagues actually at the University of Alberta, not, not to get Alberta in trouble again, uh, <laughs> but in the, uh, uh, in the journal Canadian Public Policy in 1999, uh, published a study which looked at the effects of projected changes in climate on agricultural land rents across Canada. And agricultural land rents are what you can expect to earn on a net basis from growing typically field crops. And they found that for the then available projections of changes in climate, and it's warmer temperatures and precipitation, uh, that there were extensive areas in Canada that were um, that they expected to benefit, uh, largely in Saskatchewan, but to some extent in Manitoba and Alberta. And then their, their, their findings basically, it, there, there's a lot of technical modeling involved in this, but, but what Canadians often don't appreciate is that Canada has an extensive land resource of extremely fertile farmland that's limited in its production capacity by two things. The first thing is the growing season is too short. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is there's not enough precipitation that falls during the growing season. Everything else is there. And, and much of Saskatchewan falls into that category. So if a climate projection says, as most climate projections do for Canada, that the growing season will get longer and there'll be more precipitation in the growing season, then that does give rise to the possibility of substantial benefits for agricultural production. This is where it gets so complicated in determining when government policy needs to intervene. And it's why I wanted to start with talking about harm. Does Do you have to have a demonstrable harm before you would develop a policy mechanism to, to resolve it. And so we talked a little bit about moving to the nuisance, but you gave the example of back in the 60s, being able to light certain rivers on fire. That clearly was something that was not a neutral. I mean, me having to, to put up with the, the smell of money, mm -hmm. that's one thing, but not being able to drink drinking water and knowing that it, you could light it on fire, so it's, it's probably harming and killing fish. It seems like there's a, a harm spectrum that, uh, that that you're on where it requires some kind of intervention. I, I don't know if I'm now speaking politically or if you can measure that economically. Well, I, I, I want to take a different tack on that because I think often there is a misattribution of cause hmm. that takes place in people's minds when they see a pollution problem. They see the consequence. And they assume, and many economists are in this category, they assume that this pollution, this consequence, this harm is the product of something called a market failure, an externality. Mm -hmm. And the remedy to the externality is some, some sort of regulation or a tradable permit or an emissions tax or whatever. But I think that the story is often more complicated than that. And here I want to go back to an important uh, story that Elizabeth tells in her book, Property Rights in Defense of Nature. And it's a story about Sudbury. And it's, it's getting to be a little bit out of date now because most people don't appreciate the reputation that Sudbury had as mm. an urban area in the 1970s. But Sudbury had an unenviable reputation. And it's unenviable reputation. And there's a story, and I don't know whether the story is true or not, but that when, when, the, when NASA was looking for a location to test the lunar rover that they were going to send to the moon, the little go-kart that the astronauts were going to buzz around the moon with, that they took it to Sudbury to test it because that was the landscape most like the moon that they could find. Now, I don't know whether that's a true story or not, but I've heard it from a number of sources. So the point is that Sudbury had this reputation as a place where plants didn't grow, where trees didn't grow, and that this was a consequence of air pollution. And 
many economics textbooks use the Sudbury case as an example of an externality and that the solution to externalities is government policy or government regulation. So Elizabeth uh, took the uh, novel approach of saying, let's look at the history. Let's look at the legal history and see if we can find, trace back the origin story of the sulfurous precipitation air pollution problem in Sudbury. Mm -hmm. She traced it back to 1916. And, and what happened in 1916? In, in 1916, uh, a judge, Justice Middleton, combined about a half a dozen nuisance cases that forest landowners and farmers downwind from Sudbury brought against the smelters. And they said, this stuff that you're belching into the air is falling down on our trees and it's killing them. It's harming our crops. That's a nuisance. As property owners, we should be able to uh, receive uh, compensation or we should even be able to get an injunction to, to uh, a, a cease and desist order because you are committing a nuisance against us. So Justice Middleton really, I think, inappropriately from a legal point of view said i've got these six cases on my schedule they're all nuisance cases they all involve the smelters i'm just going to combine them so he arbitrarily combined them into almost a mini class action and so he heard these cases together and then he rendered his judgment and his judgment was important in several respects first he said yes based on the evidence it is clear that the smelters are committed a nuisance against the landowners downwind. But, and, and, and here's the big but, the smelting of nickel and other minerals is important to the community. It's an important source of employment. Mm. It's an important source of tax revenue. And it's an important source of products to fight the war effort. 1916. Interesting. So they were producing metals that were used in armaments in World War One. Wow. It makes Whoa. you wonder if it had been at a different time, either earlier or later, if you would have come to the same conclusion. Hard to say. Hard to read the mind of Justice Middleton. But what for whether he would have decided this at a different time or not, what he decided was, I am not going to grant the injunction. I am not mm. going to impose damages. Uh a few years later, I, can't, I think around 1921, the legislature of the province of Ontario passed a statute and it had something like Clean Air Act in the name of the statute. So this is a lesson, kids, that, that don't take for granted that the title of the statute actually does what it says it's doing. Because one of the provisions in this statute was... Uh, smelters in the Sudbury area will hereby no longer be subject to the law of nuisance uh, oh. for any emissions that they produce. So why is that story important? Well, it completely blows up the externality story. Right. It's not. It, 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 so what is the alternative then? It, it, it's it essentially. Wasn't a, it wasn't a market failure. It was a non-market failure. It was a policy failure. It was a judicial failure. So Justice Middleton in conjunction with the legislature of the province of Ontario, hmm. set up the system which resulted in the reputation that Sudbury had in the 1960s of a place where plants wouldn't grow. Okay, I sense that there's an update to this story. So if I go to Sudbury today, will I find that there are plants there? What happened uh, now that we've had 40, 50 years of environmental movement? Well, what, what we have is much taller smokestacks. <laughs> So, oh, so the, and the, so now, the protection still exists. I, that, I, I don't know. That's, that's an interesting, I, I don't think that the case has been overturned hmm. or that the 1921 statute uh, has been uh, revoked, but there has certainly been outcry and an awareness that there's something wrong in Sudbury. And so higher and higher smokestacks were the, uh, were the solution. Uh, to this, which, you know, obviously doesn't make the problem go away. It just disperses it so that the concentration is lower and 
and the, the smokestack means that the substances travel further downwind than otherwise would be so the case. Isn't that a legitimate argument though? That I mean we have we get grant the power of eminent domain. Um I think that's the what term they use for it in the United States and Canada. I think we call it expropriation. We grant mm -hmm. the power of the state to do things in the public interest for the public good. Fighting a war effort seems like a, a pretty legitimate use of that power and making arguments that if you balance the economic growth and all the, the tax revenues generated and all the good that we will be able to do relative mm -hmm. to the harm, is, is that not a legitimate economic argument to make on cost benefit? Yeah, I, I guess the, the two points that I'd wanna make about that is uh, first, as an economist, I think it's important uh, for us to do our homework on this origin story. Mm. That to view the Sudbury problem, the air pollution problem as a market failure when historically and legally it was not, means that we're misdiagnosing the origin. We're misdiagnosing the cause. And if you misdiagnose the cause, maybe your remedy is not, uh, not uh, appropriate. Second piece, however, of relevant information is um, Donald Deweese, uh, who was an economist working at the University of Toronto Law School and one of his colleagues in 1992, I believe, did a really important historical study where they went back to the Sudbury case in 1916. And they said, Justice Middleton concluded that requiring the smelters to pay damages would have meant the loss of, among other things, minerals, for, metals for the war effort. That was Justice Middleton's assumption. Was that true? Uh -huh. So what Deweese did was he went back and looked at the financial statements of the smelters at the time. And he and his colleague uh, surveyed abatement procedures that were available in 1916. Not modern pollution abatement procedures, but historical measures that could have been taken in 1916. And they found two things that were important. First is there were abatement procedures hmm. that were available, not as effective, not as elegant as what we can do today, but there were abatement procedures that were available. The second thing, and this is more important, is that they were not that costly hmm. and that the based on the financial statements of the smelters, they could very well have employed those abatement procedures had they been required to do so and would have still remained profitable, still could have mm. employed the people in the area, still could have produced the metals for the war effort. But what Justice Middleton assumed and what the legislature assumed a few years later was that those costs would have driven the smelters out of business. So that appears to not be the case. Interesting. So there's a whole area of economics that you write about in public choice and how bureaucracies and governments make decisions. And this, I think this is one of the things that people find a bit unseemly about business is that business is able to lobby governments to pass protective policies that shield them from having to make amends for nuisance mm -hmm. or make abatements. And so I wonder, I wonder if it's a bit of a diversion to go down that path and talk about about why that is. Can, can you can you talk about that a little bit so we can understand how the uh, how economics and politics intersect? Well, let me put in a plug for somebody whose work I don't think gets as much uh, attention north of the border as it should. This is an economist named Bruce Yandel. Bruce Yandel for many years was a professor of economics at Clemson University. Uh, known for its football team, but they really should be known for being the place where Bruce Yandel did excellent work as an economist. Bruce started his career at the uh, Environmental Protection Agency in the United oh. States. So he did his PhD, and before he was a professor, he worked as a research economist at the Environmental Protection Agency. And he very quickly realized that much of what his professors had taught him as a graduate student seem to be wrong. See, what his professors had taught him is that business opposes regulations in general and environmental regulations in particular. And what Bruce found was that there were a number of industry associations and businesses that were coming to the EPA recommending and supporting regulations. Hmm. 
Bruce said, this is impossible. This, this can't be. All my professors told me this is the equivalent of watching water run uphill. So he got curious about that. How is it that this thing that all my professors told me can't possibly happen? I'm seeing happen every, almost every day that I go into work. And what he discovered is an important insight about public choice theory, which is that regulation can be a competitive advantage mm. for an established firm because it can, in various ways, reduce the amount of competition that they face from new entrants to the industry. It can do this in two ways. One is often these businesses would come to the EPA and propose a regulation, but ask to be what, what is called grandfathered in. Oh dear. So we, we think this regulation would be a good idea, but it really should be applied to new enterprises. And of course, that means the new enterprises are less likely to start up and the existing enterprises are not subject to as much competition. The second factor is that the established enterprises uh, often have a large enough revenue base and administrative structure that they have their own legal department, they have their own lobbyists, they have their own uh, capacity, uh, engineering capacity, uh, that they can work with the regulations uh, and it's less burdensome for them than for a new entrant that's, you know, scrambling with all the things that startups have to do. And now they've got this new thing that they have to do. I'm beginning to understand now, because you've given two examples about the difference between market failure and non-market failure, because that's another example of the business may have asked for that, but it's up to the officials to say, no, <laughs> we're going to maintain yes. the, the market mechanisms and we're going to maintain the, the protections. Mm -hmm. And so I, I guess that's the interesting thing I'm, I'm taking from our conversation is that you have to know what the foundational story is. Where did the mm -hmm. problem we're seeing today come about? Because then you can go back and reverse the policy or mm -hmm. change the law. Mm -hmm. or relitigate so you have a different decision is is that sort of part of the, the the tracing that we have to do on a lot of these environmental issues yeah th there's a story that i tell some of my classes uh that um that goes something like this um if the dean were to give me a budget so that i could actually take the class on a field trip but i can't but i'm gonna sketch out a hypothetical field trip so we get on the bus and we leave campus and I take them to an undisclosed location. And in this undisclosed location, there's a river. And the, the river is meandering along. And on the banks of the river on one side, there's a large building. And there's a pipe that runs from the building into the river. And there's some sort of colored liquid that's coming out of the pipe. And it's being uh, injected into the river. And then we go a little bit downstream in the river. And we see there are dead fish. Hmm. And, uh, and this makes us sad because we're environmental science students and dead fish make us sad. So the, the question that I ask for the students is, is, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So the, the free field trip just isn't a, a, a day off school that you actually have to do work. So in the bus on the way home, I say, here's your homework assignment. I want you to tell me whether this is a market failure, an mm -hmm. externality, or whether it's a non-market failure. Uh, a derived externality is the technical term for that. Um, and so, you know, I imagine in this uh, hypothetical scenario, the students debating among themselves and some of them saying it's a market failure and some of them saying it's a non-market failure. Uh, and then we get back to the campus and I say, okay, what's your answer? And they're divided. And I say, well, I apologize. It was a trick question. And the reason it was a trick question was the answer, is it a market failure or a non-market failure, cannot be resolved hmm. by observing the biophysical facts. In order to know if it's a market failure or a non-market failure, we have to examine the legal and the policy history that went before. Right. So is this building with the pipe injecting this contaminant into the river, do they have a legislative shield against liability for nuisance? If they do, 
then that's a not market failure. Okay. Now here's where I understand why it would be that, um, that those who are involved in industry might ask for an exemption because the example that you gave, you've got dead fish, so you can see a harm, but there is a certain amount of emissions that you can do, whether it's into water or whether it's into the air that doesn't have measurable harm on human health or measure, measurable harm on the environment or animal health. And I'm wondering if that should matter because I feel like we've gone down this track of zero's the answer. We mm. need zero emissions. We need zero harm. We need zero deaths. Precautionary position, uh, uh, principle says one death mm. is one too many. Mm. And I'm, I'm wondering if that's part of the issue is that if you become that strident that you could never release anything at any time for any reason, even if it causes harm or not, then none of us would be able to do much of anything when it came mm -hmm. to development, establishing a factory. And so how are we supposed to think our way through that? Is the notion that any emission is uh, just inherently harmful. And so the only way to be allowed to continue doing so is to pay compensation to everyone around you. It sort of buys you some kind of license to have a certain amount of emissions, or should we be striving for new regulations that ultimately get us to zero? I just, I'm, I think that we've gone down a certain track and I, mm -hmm. I have to wonder what is the reasonable path? I think you, you quote uh, Thomas Sowell in, in, in one of your lectures where you talk about mm -hmm. Uh, what are we trying to get to? What are we comparing it to? What cost? What's the hard data? Walk me through the matrix I should be using to be thinking about that. Because I, I do, I, you know, I part, let me just give you one more example from my property rights advocacy days. I was watching the development of endangered species legislation in the U.S. And they were shutting down massive government infrastructure projects because they would find endangered species. I think it was leopard frogs in one area or spotted owls in another. I think it was endangered species of lichen somewhere else. And it struck me that there probably is a down that path, a, a reasonable point where you'd say, okay, yes, construction would need to stop. But if you take a, you cannot harm a single animal on this list or any of its habitat, that's really just a license to, to stop development and, mm -hmm. and interfere in the investment decisions and therefore sort of the property rights of the person who's trying to do the development. So how do you think your way through those problems? Because it, it seems to me like we've gone really far down one track and maybe there's a more reasonable middle ground. Well, I'll, I'll chat a little bit about what I think the orthodox economic perspective uh, is on that even though in many cases I'm quite critical of economic orthodoxy, but in, there is uh, something there that I think is useful to, to the topic that you've raised. But I think one of the mistakes that economists made, and John Dales didn't make this mistake, by the way, but many people who came after John Dales did, is that when they came across pollution problems, they thought they were the first people to ever perceive these problems existing. And they didn't stop and think, has anybody else dealt with anything like, dealt with this problem before and can we learn anything from them? Mm -hmm. Because they didn't ask that question, they didn't hang out enough with lawyers. And in particular, they didn't stop to understand tort law. And the, uh, transgression of nuisance in tort law starts to address some of the problems that you've outlined in your questions. Uh, trespass is simply to place or to a, cause to be placed something on somebody else's property. And trespass is a tort, even if it doesn't do any harm. Hmm. So if you trespass, then you can be liable. And someone against whom you are committing a trespass or uh, they anticipate you're gonna commit a trespass, they can get an injunction against you uh, and, and you can be liable for, for trespass. Nuisance is a slightly more serious uh, transgression because there, there has to be a demonstration of harm. And traditionally courts have applied sort of a threshold test hmm. so that a certain that the harm has to be substantial enough to make it worth the court's while to apply 
um, to require to, to apply damages or to uh, grant uh, an injunction. And so I, I think those are good first steps. I think tort law is a good starting place for us to think about some of these uh, pollution oriented problems. And riparian rights is another aspect of, um, of the tort uh, approach that if I've got this pipe and I'm pumping some substance into the river and it's killing fish downstream or it's making people sick downstream, then I've committed, uh, I've violated their riparian rights as riparian landowners uh, down uh, downstream. So I think that's 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 a good place to start with some of the questions that you're talking about. It's a very helpful way of framing it. Now, I think that the environmentalists who are taking energy companies to court on the issue of CO2 emissions are probably relying on some of that jurisprudence to make the same case. But can you make that same case? Is it it, it's, it becomes complicated when you look at uh, global ambient emissions. You compare Canada's emissions with the rest of the world. Do you can you hold North American situated companies responsible for a problem that appears to be more largely generated in some of the larger population countries like India and and China, the mm -hmm. um, United States certainly to, um, as well, but but Russia and elsewhere. It seems like the notion is that Canada has to bear the burden of all of the cost for externalities. I don't know if I'd be using the right word that are, are being created elsewhere. So how do we think through that issue? Can you use trespass and nuisance in the court process in discussing the issue of CO2 or do we need to use some other, other tool of thinking about it? Well, originally, and I guess I've sort of changed my mind on this for practical reasons. Originally, I thought that it was a good idea for the courts to be a venue to tackle climate change as a trespass and nuisance issue. Hmm. This goes back to an essay that Murray Rothbard wrote in 1982 called Pollution Law. Oh boy, I should have this uh, uh, be more familiar with the reference. Um, hmm. We'll look I it up. Yeah, anyway, oh. well, I, I can get you the reference for it. But yeah. it's Murray Rothbard wrote it in 1982, published in the Cato Journal. And in that, he outlined how tort law could be used to address, he was primarily focused on air pollution problems, but the yep. extension to water pollution problems is pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. There are some uh, people working in that tradition that have sketched out what Rothbard's framework would look like for dealing with climate. And, and the logic goes something like this. If someone emits carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and that creates uh, weather related, climate related damages for somebody else, then that's a nuisance. And the person who is the victim of the nuisance should be able to seek compensation uh, or uh, maybe even an injunction. The, the big problem is jurisdiction because uh, there's no court that has jurisdiction over India and Canada, right? Where do you go if you are a, a farmer in Bangladesh and you want to sue, even on a class action basis, uh, an electrical utility in Nebraska? So, so it's not easy, but that and was- And there's also an equity issue too, because as you'd mentioned in our starting point, when you have um, high levels of poverty and food insecurity, and you're wanting to see people increase their economic well-being, it seems unfair that you would take India and Canada to court at the same time. Because I think that's sort of how we've kind of framed it, is it's the mm -hmm. rich countries that have got to slow down so other countries have a chance to catch up, and then ultimately everybody has to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. But that makes for pretty murky analysis in economics. It may, it may, maybe it makes good politics, but it becomes hard to think through what the solution is in economics. Well, and, and as I said, I, I think I've changed my mind on this because uh, initially I thought this would be a, a venue that uh, that could be used to resolve some of the competing science claims. Hmm. And, and one of the things that happens in litigation that I think many people don't appreciate is the level of scrutiny of evidence that takes place in cross-examination. And... I've lived my life in the academic world, 
And so I'm, and I've been an editor and I've been a reviewer. I'm pretty familiar with the process of peer review. But I've also on occasion served as an expert witness and I have been cross-examined under oath as an expert witness. And my personal experience is that the scrutiny that evidence receives under cross-examination in a litigation context is far higher, far more demanding than peer review. Hmm. And one of the problems that we have with science on the climate front is the, the range of competing claims that are made. And it's all peer reviewed science. So how do you resolve whether claim hmm. A is true or claim B is true or claim C is true when all A, B and C have been peer reviewed by different disciplines in different outlets by different scientists. Cross-examination brings all of that together and puts all of the evidence under that critical scrutiny. So in my naivete, I thought maybe this is a way to resolve some of the ongoing unsettled areas of science or the conflicted areas of science when it comes to climate. The reason I've changed my mind on this is that environmental litigation on climate has not done what I hoped it would do. Mm -hmm. Typically, litigation is not suing polluters, but it's suing governments. Mm -hmm. And so plaintiffs are coming to the courts and saying, we want you to issue an order that the government of the United States or the government of Canada or the government of the Netherlands do the following things. And, uh, I, 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 and for the most part, courts have looked at that and said, we don't think that we have jurisdiction. We don't think that we have competence. And there have been a number of high yeah. profile cases in the United States where where the courts have said, uh, this is a complicated area of international diplomacy. And as a judge, I'm not competent to make that decision. That's the function of the legislative branch. You have just also then explained to me why, in, 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 in great understanding, why it is that the carbon tax challenge that the provinces took forward with the federal government failed because it was government challenging government and they all agreed on the science nobody wanted to put forward scientific evidence because once mm -hmm. governments come into the picture they have constituencies and they can't look as if they're denying science and so nobody makes the scientific argument and then it gets kicked over to the courts to to try to navigate through mm -hmm. whose jurisdiction it is that that actually mm -hmm. explains an awful lot Let's um so so what the solution that we're coming to then, and I think we can talk about it in um, other types of areas of environmental uh, policy is that that once you've established that there is a harm that needs to be mitigated, there are different ways of approaching it. And so you can have government regulation. We've just talked about why government doesn't regulate regulation doesn't work. But you can also have, various pricing schemes that mm -hmm. create market type mechanisms that allow you to solve the problems. So I think the big conversation that we're having about carbon dioxide is do you put a tax on it or do you have some kind of cap and trade and emissions trading system? And d let's begin there because that's where we, we sort of have ended up talking about uh, mm -hmm. is on the issue of carbon dioxide. Do you have a preference? for the type of mechanism that you would like to, to see used? It seems to me that it's a given that the international community in Canada, all the political parties at every level have agreed, this is a problem and it has to be abated. So I, so let's, let's assume that that's going to be the case. And if it is a problem that needs to be abated, what are the top contenders for the best solution? Well, the economics literature, starting with John Dales, John proposed uh, tradable emissions permits. Uh, subsequently, people proposed emissions taxes. In Canada, we went through this, I call it a food fight, uh, mm -hmm. over uh, emission taxes versus tradable permits. I have trouble picking sides in that food fight because mm -hmm. they are from an economic point of view, uh, equally effective 
uh, measures. Some people have argued that you require less information to do an emission tax than you than is required for uh, for a tradable permit system. I don't see that there's a significant. You, you need the same information ultimately to do either one. So I'm, I'm so it's of, immaterial. Yeah, I'm a bit of uh, maybe an eccentric on that, but uh, but when I teach my students, I say. Here's one way that economists have suggested, and here's another way that economists have suggested. And I try to point out to them that you need the same information either way. Um, I, I suppose, I, I, I think that there are implementation advantages for a tradable permit system if it is implemented in the way that uh, the, the, the conventional economics textbooks say it should be implemented. And, and let me point out that this is not what Ontario did. Hmm. Ontario said it had a cap and trade system. Uh, one of my uh, students and I looked and looked and looked and looked at this. We, we could not in all honesty conclude that it really was a cap and trade system. Uh, it was an emission tax system that was called a cap and trade. All right. Well, let's take that same concept then and push it down because it's interesting to me that tradable emissions permits or cap and trade is caught on in different areas, especially of air pollution. I don't know if there are, are examples of water pollution. If there are other places that they've used that, you should you can tell me. I think mostly it's abatement mm -hmm. technology that they use there. Mm -hmm. But there was a concept of tradable development permits that was being discussed years ago in mm -hmm. Alberta to try to deal with some of these issues that we started off talking about. How do you deal with the loss of farmland and cropland and biodiversity and urban sprawl? And I, I wanna talk a little about how that would work because I think just intuitively, I think all of us have gone to places where we've seen cities planned in a way that looks haphazard. And it looks like, well, gee, if only somebody had gotten in there and just planned it a little bit better. I think there is a default to thinking that planning development and creating land use restrictions and creating zoning laws, that that is the preferable way to go about trying to, to develop a growing urban area where you end up with land use conflicts. And uh, I just wanna see, see what your starting point is on that. Are there times where it actually is better to have a government response, or is that also an area where we should be looking at at market solutions? Yeah, maybe I don't share your perception, but oftentimes when uh, when I see an urban built environment that looks haphazard, uh, it often occurs to me that this was the result of planning, not the absence huh. of planning that produced. Oh, you have to go back and find out what the original decisions are. Okay, a, challenge my a, notion. Why would you say that? A, that result. Well, I mean, the, going back to uh, Hayek's insight on planning, there's this huge knowledge problem that, that a planner has to face. And for the most part, planners don't acknowledge this knowledge problem. They don't acknowledge uh, that that the people out there in the countryside, the people in the villages, in the towns and cities, know things that the planners don't know, mm -hmm. and that the planners can't know. And so the planners can come up with a scheme; they can plan, but they're planning on in with an absence of information that Hayek referred to as the knowledge of the particular circumstances of time and place. They're drawing lines on a sheet of paper. They're producing diagrams and layouts in a plan. But they're planning the lives of people and those people know things that the planners don't know. And Hayek said that, that we, if we act as though what he called scientific knowledge, which is the objective knowledge that often serves as the basis for planning. And we think that that's all there is, then we can do great harm because we're not acknowledging the knowledge of the particular circumstances and time and place. There's a, there's a metaphor that I sometimes use with, with students to explain Hayek's distinction between scientific knowledge and 
and the knowledge of the particular circumstances of time and place. And I use, I put up a, di a picture of an iceberg. And I say, there's one thing that everybody knows about icebergs. What is the one thing that everybody knows about icebergs? And of course, it's always- I would say that there's a whole lot more underneath. You only see the tip. <laughs> that's right. So, so I, I, I'm a little bit fuzzy on the fraction, whether it's nine tenths or three quarters or you know, four fifths of the iceberg is below the water and you can't see it. And I said, that's, and Hayek never used this metaphor and he's probably rolling over his, in his grave that I'm suggesting this, but, but scientific knowledge is like the tip of the iceberg that everybody can see. Knowledge of the particular circumstances of time and place is like the iceberg that's under the water that the captain of the ship can't see. And so if the captain of the ship is trying to navigate across the North Atlantic on the basis of what can be seen of the above the water, then we know how that story is going to end. They make movies mm -hmm. about your life starring Leonardo DiCaprio. Well, I think that that metaphor of icebergs and ship captains and movie stars is something that should be taken more seriously into account by people who call themselves planners, urban planners, rural planners, land use planners. And remember, when you're planning, you're looking at the visible part of the iceberg above the surface and some considerable fraction is below the surface and you don't know where that is. Well, let me ask you this then. Um, I'll probably, I don't know if you do much work on, on zoning and urban planning, but let me, let me talk about where um, your agriculture economics hits the edge of the city. So isn't it government's job to say that beautiful barley field that you were plowing back in the day, some future farmer might want to be able to plow that beautiful field of barley. And so I should, so the planner should make a decision today to make sure that you're not growing a value village in a Canadian tire there because some future owner is going to value that, that agriculture land. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the argument that planners really do believe that mm -hmm. they're stewarding the environment for future generations. And there's just certain things mm -hmm. that are so valuable, like rich soil and great cropland or biodiversity and habitat for grizzly bears that they, they can't just allow for the high, the highest bidder to make the decision to destroy those lands. Is there, is there a counter argument to that? Yeah, I don't want to get too technical uh, on this, but certainly that's an argument that is frequently made about the protection of agricultural land, about preventing agricultural land from being used for non-agricultural purposes. There's a system in Canada called the Canada Land Inventory. And mm -hmm. it's really a taxonomy of qualities of agricultural land. And class one land is the land which is best suited for agriculture. It's fertile, uh, it's well-drained, it's got a long growing season, it's got adequate precipitation during the growing season. So there are really no significant impediments to productivity. So it's called class one agricultural land. And the statement is often made in agricultural communities that all class one land should be reserved for agriculture. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the technical statement that corresponds to the story that you're talking about. The problem with that perspective is that the land which is best suited for agriculture is often also best suited for a lot of other things. Class one agricultural land is often class one residential construction land. Hmm. It's often class one transportation infrastructure or recreational use hmm. or commercial and industrial development land. The problem is we don't have a land inventory system for all those other uses. And so we can say it's class one for agriculture, but there's that we forget that it is implicitly class one for all these other mm. uses. And so to say that it's class one for one use and just pretend that the others don't exist is really kind of like putting our head in the sand. It would make sense uh, just on the face of it because our early settlers 
um, in an agrarian economy would have wanted to settle on the greatest, on the best farmland. And then as more people moved mm -hmm. in and they started developing towns and cities, you would just be building where the people mm -hmm. were. And so it, it does stand to reason that you're going to end up with those conflicts. So the question is, how do you solve those conflicts? Is there, this is why I wanted to get into the issue of tradable development permits, because if a political decision is made, that certain class one agriculture lands should not be developed. It seems unfair and a violation of the rural landowners property rights to just say, okay, I'm taking away your ability to earn a future income by selling it to a, a, a value village or a Canadian tire. And you're just going to have to suck it up. And so if, uh, first of all, you have to agree, tell me whether you agree with me that, that it's sort of a legitimate decision for governments to make that certain land should be protected that way. And then we can sort of talk about how it would work otherwise to make sure that the, the, the landowner is compensated if you're interfering in that exchange. Yeah, I think I start with with the story from from the end rather than what you characterize as the beginning. And, and the end is really the, the equity problem. Mm -hmm. uh, that to, to the farmland owner who's contemplating selling the farm to someone who intends to use it for non-farming purposes. To come to that farmland owner and say, we are going to prohibit you from making that sale is inequitable to the farmland owner's point of view. The, the way I explain it to students is, is that farming doesn't have a pension plan. Mm -hmm. It's it's not like the pension that your parents look forward to receiving from the companies for which they're working or the government agency for which they're working when they retire. The value of the assets, that's the pension plan. And when we come to a farmer and say, you know, your farm might be worth a million dollars or two million dollars or ten million dollars to sell to someone who's going to use it for non-farm related purposes. We're going to prohibit that sale. You have to sell it only for farming purposes. Well, now the farm's worth, instead of a million, it's a half a million. Mm -hmm. Instead of two million, it's one million. So go home to your parents and say, mom, show me what your facial expression would be if your employer told you tomorrow, your pension is going to be half what we promised you. Dad, go to the government department for which you work. And, and your boss comes to you and says, it's been a bad year and the government has to cut pension expenditures. Your pension is going to be half of what we promised you when you started. Ask mom and dad how they feel about that. And mom and dad are probably not going to be very mm -hmm. happy. So why should the farmer be happy? You're very right, but it's sort of interesting, isn't it, how we give different tiers of protection to different types of property. So if you mm -hmm. outright took the farmer's land, there's an expropriation process and a compensation process. But if you just regulate away the ability to sell it for a certain use, mm -hmm. there isn't an adequate way of compensating them for that loss in the same way that you would have protection if it was mm -hmm. a RRSP pen or pension fund, you couldn't just mm -hmm. have an employer that would devalue it by half because there'd be consequences, but there, there isn't That's consequences right. when it comes That's to right. these kind of, I think they're called regulatory takings, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a student a few years ago and I don't know how he did this and probably it should have gone through ethics review board uh, approval, which I didn't know he was doing it. He was working on a term paper and all the students were working on term papers and he didn't tell me what he was working on, but he, he got to know a farmer in the Guelph area. And, and this farmer was getting on in years. Uh, his farm at the time was probably worth about maybe a million dollars. His children didn't want to take over the farm. Nobody else in the family was interested in taking over the farm. So he was looking to sell the farm. One day he's driving into town in his pickup truck and he notices a work crew on the side of the road going into one of his fields. And he didn't know, you know, he hadn't arranged for any work crew to come and work on his farm. So needless to say, he pulled over the side of the road and he, he stopped and he, 
started to talk to these gentlemen. And they said, well, what are you guys doing? Well, we're surveying for the parking lot. Well, this really got his attention. He knew nothing about a parking lot. He says, parking lot, parking lot. Tell me about the parking lot. Well, well, the, the people who are going to come and walk on the hiking trails to see the wetland will need some place to park. Really? Tell me more about the hiking trails. Well, the municipality is going to build hiking trails so that people can hike and see the wetland, which was designated by the conservation authority. Oh, my. So uh, needless to say, this conversation was unsettling to the farmer. So he proceeded to try and figure out what happened. Well, it turns out that the provincial legislature authorizes the conservation authorities to inventory wetlands within their areas. Yeah. Once they've inventoried wetlands, then they turn that information over to the municipality. The municipality is, must incorporate that wetland uh, information into their official plan. Their official plan includes public access for significant wetlands. The long and the short of this is that the consequence of this planning and designation uh, exercise, the farmer estimated reduced the market value of his farm to $500,000. So his pension had been cut in half. And, and, the cons and, and was, there con was there any mechanism for compensation? Well, absolutely none. He, he went to the conservation authority and said, what are you guys doing? You've just, I don't know what his words were exactly, but you, you've, you've adversely affected my uh, retirement plans through this designation. They said, well, we're just doing what the provincial government requires mm -hmm. us to do. Uh, it's not our fault. So then he went to the municipality. They said, well, the municipality said, well, we're just doing what the conservation authority told us to do. And then he went to the province and got the same sort of treatment. So there was no recourse. There was no compensation. Um, and then people wonder why wetlands get drained in sort of the middle of the night or why woodlots disappear or why endangered species habitat gets degraded in the middle of the night. So is there a way that you can compensate the landowner and protect the environment, the environmental value that you're trying to protect? What, what are some of the, what, would, what should, or should we just allow for a landowner to make the decision about whether they value those things enough to protect them? And if they don't, we accept that. Where, where does wetlands and endangered species fall into the public good category that requires some kind of intervention? How, how, do, you, how do you mediate between that? Well, the approach that I've been advocating uh, for a number of years now is something that's called the club goods model in the economics literature. Now, the club goods model originally was, a, was developed to try and understand formally organized clubs like golf clubs or swimming clubs or hmm. sailing clubs where people would pool their resources uh, in order to create something from which they could benefit so they could play golf or they could go have a place to dock their sailboat or what have you but the club goods model is applicable in other contexts and it's applicable in the wildlife habitat context. Mm. And there are a number of organizations that have been actively doing this. They just, you know, we're in the business of doing things, not in the business of understanding economic theory. And then economic theory afterwards came along and said, oh, what you guys are doing is the club goods model. So, so organizations like uh, Delta Waterfowl, Ducks Unlimited, Trout Unlimited, uh, a number of organizations uh, have approached landowners and said, our membership really likes something that you have on your farm. We really value something. We really value this wetland. We really value this woodlot. We really value this habitat that's on your property. And we've done some fundraising. We've got membership dues. We sell magazines, et cetera. And we're willing to pay you 
to maintain that thing that we value on your farm. You don't have to participate in this, by the way. It's not compulsory. It's not a regulation. It's a voluntary program. But the farmer can look at that and say, if I keep the wetlands, then this group will send me a check for $100 per acre per year, as long as I maintain the wetland. And I have to maintain the wetland according to the parameters that they stipulate because they're buying a service from me. I look at that and I say, well, it's going to cost me a lot of money to cut down the woodlot or to drain the, the, the wetland anyway. Uh, I can leave it the way it is. And here's a little bit of money coming in. And it doesn't impair the selling price of the property. It may even enhance the selling price of the property. So I think that that's, that's a model for wildlife, for habitat, that is better than the current model, which is, as you've called it, the regulatory takings approach, which is what the farmer that my student interviewed. So subject to. property rights wins again. So let's go full circle and go back to the trout, because now that we've mm -hmm. had this conversation about how property rights and respecting property rights and going back to the initial poor decision being made is often to explains the reason why you have environmental problems. Explain how in Germany they were able to own the trout in the river to such an extent, such a strong right that uh, people wouldn't even dream of just pulling out the the uh, the fishing rod and going mm -hmm. and, and taking one of them. What is the structure that they use there? Is there or, and can it be applied to other types of goods? Is that a club model too? Um, I'm not sure that anybody has has documented the history of the emergence of. Uh, fishing rights in Europe. And it's not just in Germany. Uh, there are many places in the United Kingdom and elsewhere in Europe uh, where there are uh, uh, ownership rights in uh, wild fish. How did they come into existence? Um, I'm not sure. It may go back mm -hmm. to feudalism, uh, where the lord of the manor uh, owned everything, including mm -hmm. the hunting lands and the uh, uh, and the uh, uh, the, the fish in the streams. I'm picturing oh. now a scene from Robin Hood where one of the young kids gets caught by Robin Hood because he's mm -hmm. taken one of the king's deer. So I see where you're going with that. Mm -hmm. So it may, maybe that was the origin. Uh, I don't know. Um, but uh, but the, the, the thing that impressed me about the German situation was uh, that even though none of the Germans who were accompanying us that day were anglers and none of them were from this town, they knew it was a, it's so well established hmm. in German history and German culture and German law that they simply said somebody owns those fish. There's a story that John Dales tells in his book, Pollution, uh, Property and Prices, about a, a wildlife biologist who used to be the senior wildlife biologist for the province of Ontario. Uh, and his, his name was uh, Doug Clark. And remember, I came across this book shortly after I got back from Germany, and I'm puzzling over this, this situation that I've observed that was so contrary to everything that I've been taught. So John Dales reports being at a conference the previous year, and uh, Doug Clark was speaking at the conference. And Clark's background is wildlife biology. He is sometimes described as the Aldo Leopold of Canada. So he was one of Canada's earliest environmentalists. So Clark reports about being on a trip to uh, Scotland and the UK the previous year. And he said, I was walking along a stream and I walked over a bridge and I looked down in the river and I was shocked at what I saw. That they had more abundant mm. trout and salmon stocks than we have in Ontario. And I'm in charge of all of the trout and salmon. That's my job. And we are not doing as well in Ontario as they're doing in this industrial area of the United Kingdom that I just visit. And I don't know what caused that. And I read that story and I thought, Doug, I feel your pain. 
you are a great storyteller. Thank you for spending so much time with me today. I'm sure we could go on for another hour. I appreciate it. Well, it's been my pleasure. It's good to see you again. We haven't uh, talked for quite a while, but uh, well, I hope I'm you're doing well. I'm glad you had uh, that little row with Elizabeth Brubaker, because I think it was from reading her book that I ended up coming across mm. your work, and I've been following it for some time. So I'm so glad we were able to talk about it today. That was Glenn Fox. He is a retired professor of agricultural economics from the University of Guelph and a senior fellow with the Fraser Institute. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe on YouTube and wherever you stream your podcasts. And to stream old episodes, learn more about the show, and where to subscribe and submit your questions for future guests, visit FraserForum.org.